They had tornadoes. Oh, we've had, we have had some, but we didn't, not today. It's, we just had some thunderstorms earlier this morning, but yeah, we've had tornadoes come through. Just barely missed us, but. Welcome, friends, as we prepare our hearts and our minds and our spirit for study. I'm welcoming you now to just find a comfortable position, sitting, or even standing as we reflect and prepare for our time together. Today, gratitude fills my heart with warmth and contentment. Today, my daily life is enriched with gratitude for all I have. Every morning, I wake up with gratitude in my heart. Gratitude helps me see the beauty in the ordinary. I express gratitude for the love I receive and give. With gratitude, I recognize the blessings in my life. Gratitude steers me towards positive thoughts and actions. My challenges are easier to face with gratitude in my heart. Gratitude is the foundation of my peace and happiness. I find reason for gratitude in every experience. I praise God for my optimism as it opens doors to new possibilities and opportunities. Each day, I fuel my life with unwavering optimism. Optimism is the lens through which I view challenges as opportunities. With optimism, I transform obstacles into stepping stones. I radiate optimism and attract positive energy. Optimism is my natural state of mind guiding me through life. My optimism is a source of strength and resilience.
in every situation, I choose optimism and hope. My heart is filled with optimism, no matter the circumstances. Optimism guides me to find the silver lining in every cloud. Resilience. I am resilient and capable of bouncing back from any challenge. My resilience is a source of strength in tough times. With each setback, I become more resilient and determined. I am resilient in the face of adversity, always moving forward. My resilience empowers me to overcome obstacles with grace. Being resilient allows me to grow and learn from my experiences. I am resilient, transforming challenges into opportunities. Resilient by nature, I adapt and thrive in changing circumstances. My resilience shines brighter when faced with difficulties. I am resilient, capable of navigating through life's storm. Curiosity. My curiosity opens doors to endless learning and discovery. I embrace each day with a curious and open mind. Curiosity fuels my passion for learning and growth. I am always curious, seeking to understand the world around me. With a curious heart, I uncover life's marvelous mysteries. My curiosity leads me to exciting and unexplored paths. Being curious enriches my experiences and broadens my perspectives. I cherish my curious nature as it propels me forward.
Every question I ask enhances my curiosity and knowledge. I am grateful for my curious spirit leading to innovation and creativity. Confidence. My confidence is a natural part of who I am and whose I am. I radiate confidence in every situation. Confidence is my key to unlocking new opportunities. With every step, my confidence grows stronger. I am confident in my ability to achieve my goals. My confidence allows me to face challenges with ease. I trust in my decisions guided by confidence. Confidence shines through me in all my interactions. I am brimming with confidence, ready to tackle the day. My confidence is unshakable in the face of adversity. Compassion. My heart is filled with compassion for myself and others. I lead my life with compassion and understanding. Compassion is a guiding force in all my interactions. I embrace each day with a spirit of compassion. My compassion for others knows no bounds. I offer compassion freely for those in need. Compassion is the language my heart speaks fluently. I nurture my relationships with compassion and care.
My actions are driven by deep compassion for humanity. I find strength in my ability to show compassion. Mindfulness. Mindfulness guides me to live in the present moment. Each day, I embrace life with mindfulness and awareness. My mindfulness practice brings me peace and clarity. I cultivate mindfulness to enrich my experiences. Mindfulness helps me connect deeply with the world around me. With mindfulness, I approach each day with calm and balance. I find strength and serenity in mindfulness. Mindfulness is a path to understanding myself and others. I am grateful for the insights mindfulness brings into my life. Through mindfulness, I discover the beauty in every moment. I have a growth mindset. Personal growth is a journey I am committed to. I am creative. Each moment presents an opportunity to be creative. Kindness. Kindness is a gift I freely give and happily receive. Patience. Patience enhances my ability to handle stress and change. Courage. I find courage in moments of doubt and uncertainty. I praise God. For having the right mindset. Amen and amen. It is so good to be with you tonight, and I believe you're going to be blessed in ways unexpected, and in those that came hungry will be blessed in ways that will fill your appetite as we lean into the book of 
Acts. I'm excited uh, about this book and the season and all that it can offer us as we lean into the summer months. Well, not quite yet. And so the 22nd to 23rd, I believe that starts. But as we finish out spring and enter into summer, um, we've got the potential to make this summer one of the most transformative summers that we've ever had. And there are events that will allow you to do that, as well as I encourage you to go back and listen to this recording, because I'm going to cover a lot of ground, <laughs> uh, because there's so much there, and all I'm looking at is one chapter. We're going to slow down probably along the way and take two weeks with some of the chapters, but we're going to look at, uh, well, we'll probably get through verse 12. Uh, tonight, looking in Acts, the fourth chapter, um, and we'll be sharing some opportunities that will enhance your experience uh, along with um, our study tonight. So let's see where <laughs> to begin. Let me begin with prayer, and then I will um, uh, give a... Uh, Quick overview of Acts 1 and 2, Acts 3 from last week, and then a beginning overview of the first part, first portion of Acts 4. And we're going to find ourselves in the text, right? We're going to find ourselves in the text in ways that we haven't before. And I'm excited about that because God answers prayer. And my part of my prayer has been, God, give me uh, what I need in order to uh, receive you in a new way. Position me, show me, guide me, uh, help me to ask you the right questions if I don't know what to ask, in order that um, I might have the, uh, the experience of the transformation that I know you want to have in the larger body. And uh, I tell you, back to the reason for the meditation to begin, I'm more than convinced. I am 100% uh, uh, certain that our minds are like computers and where we focus, uh, our attention goes. And our attention, uh, our, our focus and attention are tied. And what that means is when in our free will, right? Uh, God gave us the free will to focus. And in that free will, he gave us the, the ability to place our attention anywhere we want. And we will see <laughs> where we place our fo focus and give our attention. And so it is. Without some guided methodology, without discipline, we focus in all, all we're all over the map. Um, but if we throughout the day and before Bible study take time uh, to do what the first disciples had did naturally, and that is, y'all you, see Michael grubbing out. You could be grubbing out here too. We've got <laughs> we've got some uh, also got some pasta salad with a lot of vegetables in it for those that don't like pizza. Uh, quick, uh, I'm looking at Mike on the screen. Quick uh, plug to say hey. Um, try to come out once a month in person and uh, definitely every week, uh, every week, do your darnness to be present. And when you can't, make no excuses for listening to the recording um, because it's going to be a change for you, no doubt in my mind. And so as we create this focus before Bible study, several times during the day where we pray and meditate, um, we are starting... Uh, we're going to be looking at some other Gospels, too, um, that uh, some called the Gnostic Gospels this summer, uh, specifically the Gospel of Thomas, and draw out things from that and talk about what it meant, Gnosticism meant, big fancy word um, that uh, they used to disqualify it from the Bible. And now those that called it the Gnostic Gospels are even changing that name. It all will add to our ability to see Jesus in a bigger, uh, bigger way. And one thing you can count on, when God gets bigger in your life, uh, love expands. 
when God gets bigger, um, you become more inclusive. I become more inclusive, um, not exclusive. When God gets bigger, and these are just some landmarks or some uh, things to look out for if you want to know whether you're growing or not. Uh, fear and anxiety uh, decrease, right? Uh, faith and passion increase. And we're going to see how that happened in the early disciples and how that can happen for us. And um, I'm going to ask you to come on camera if you can. And if you don't, we understand. If you can't, we understand. So that we can simulate as much as possible being together. Amen. All right. Well, let's pray. God, we say thank you for not allowing or causing or um, having us go on a journey without directions. Where you lead, you provide, and where you provide, you guide. We thank you for the early disciples who 2,000 years ago lived in their context and shared the good news, experience, and power of your presence in that culture. And now 20, oh yeah, huh, 2,000 years later, in our context, you call us to grow to not put our heads in the sand, but to, to look around and dare to uh, use the minds that you have given us so that we increase in our understanding, grow in faith and in wisdom, and in our daily lives. Not only do we experience your presence in new ways, day by day and uh, at times hours by hour, but we also become that illumination that others see the light and they uh, began to allow that light to shine within them as well. Tonight, show us what we haven't seen before. Uh, meet us at the intersection of the limits of our box in expansion. <laughs> uh, meet us at that place so that we grow tonight. And we know when we wake up in the morning, something has shifted. We thank you in advance. In Christ's name we pray and say, amen. Okay, well, friends, uh, let's go to a little context and overview first with Acts, the third chapter, and the beginning of Acts, the fourth chapter. Uh, as we know, the season of Pentecost began uh, in the book of Acts, where Dr. Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke, he starts writing this account to uh, a friend um, that he wanted, uh, Theophilus, that he wanted him to understand as best he could who Jesus is and how things unfolded. And so it was one of those uh, festivals right after Passover when they got together for Pentecost and the disciples were there because when before Jesus was crucified, uh, he had told the disciples, um, and actually after he was crucified and he had uh, re revealed himself to some of the disciples, he said, go to Jerusalem and just wait. And as we know, we get tired of waiting uh, <laughs> uh, sometimes uh, in five minutes, we're tired of waiting. Well, they knew that nothing was more important in life, so they were there waiting. And then on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was unleashed, and it happened to be 50 days after uh, the resurrection. 50 days after the resurrection, i.e. 50 days after Easter, it was on that Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit was unleashed, as mm -hmm. it was predicted by the prophet Joel, uh, Joel, some pronounce it Joel, um, proclaimed that uh, uh, God said, I will pour out my spirit on all of humankind. And the pouring out of that spirit is what happens in Acts, and it begins the birth of the church. We can have a building called a church building, but if the Holy Spirit is not uh, the head of the governance, then it's a church building. Uh, it's not the church. Um, the the uh, the presence of the Holy Spirit 
uh, is paramount, is mandatory um, to be present for us to be the church that is described in uh, uh, the canonical or canonical gospels, the Bible, right? Um, and so we must realize that that is what, before we do, before we speak, before we think, we must accompany our thoughts, uh, our actions with the Holy Spirit. Because when we act before we, um, you, we, before we combine our actions with the Holy Spirit, then we're doing it out of our own strength. And it is uh, uh, not sustainable. And so part of the meditation prior to Bible study, if you wonder why, again, it is to position ourselves so that our cups can be filled by the Holy Spirit so that we can indeed um, hear the word of God. We cannot just hear the word of God with our own minds. Our minds must be illuminated by the Holy Spirit. And the way that the Holy Spirit does that is aligns our head and aligns our heart, right? John Wesley said, my heart was strangely warm. Uh, we know that the head and the heart both have brains, right? And that's why sometimes we are torn because we want to go right and we want to go left. And that's because there's a disconnect between the connectivity of our purpose, which is found in the alignment of head and heart. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And we're going to see that that's what the Holy Spirit did in Acts as compared to where Luke left off and the scared disciples earlier on in the book. So the Holy Spirit has come and then we get to Acts 3 where Peter and John, uh, the Holy Spirit has been unleashed. They're going to the temple at the hour of prayer. And uh, understand that prayer and meditation go together. Uh, in some of the older biblical texts, it talks about prayer and meditation or prayer and meditation where there are prayers and there's meditation together. Um, so there is um, there is a uh, seamless um, connection between the two. And so they are going to the uh, temple to pray. And here again, God does his best work when we are interrupted, they are going to the temple to pray on their way in. They are there uh, stopped by a man, a lame man begging them, uh, begging them for alms. Uh, it is believed that he was begging them for money at the beautiful gate. Why did they say beautiful gate? Well, it was very expensive and it was one of seven gates and this was uh, uh, adorned with very expensive metals. And this is where he was laying. So he asked Peter for money, Peter and John, that is. And instead of money, Peter heals him in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And Peter commands the man to rise and walk. And immediately <laughs> the man's feet and his ankles are made strong. He enters the temple with them. He's not only walking, but he begins leaping, and then he's, uh, his leaping turns into praise. On this past Sunday, we lifted up an acronym that I call, or we'll say RAP, R-A-A-P. Um, if we want to go from paralysis to, uh, to praise, then we see four things that uh, can continue that paralysis. We talked about you know, don't just think about uh, being able to not to walk physically as the only type of paralysis. We talked about societal paralysis, uh, mental paralysis, um, spiritual paralysis, and uh, the four ways to move from paralysis to praise we see exhibited here by this man who was lame. Uh, first thing he did was recognize his need. He knew he needed uh, the... Uh, um, income of some type in order to live day by day because he uh the begging was his job you know he couldn't go out and be a bricklayer or be this or that because his body uh was not functioning 
And so he used what he had, right, to, to get what he needed. Or he recognized his need. He needed sustenance. So he was using what he had. And then the next A is uh, R, he recognized his need. Uh, I'm going to start putting stuff in the chat, too, so that those that are taking notes, you can download this afterwards. And uh, you download it by hitting that little thing. It looks like a little plane uh, in the right side of your chat box. But they are the four things that I'm talking about uh, currently that we see um, led from paralysis to praise. He recognized his need. And then A, attention. He gave God his attention, attention, attention. Yeah, where your attention goes, your focus goes. And that is a part of free will, right? If we want to pay attention to all the things that are going wrong, we will bring them naturally into focus. If we want to pay attention to the reasons we have to be fearful, then we will bring those things into focus. It's a part of the divine gift of sons and daughters of the Most High God to be able to do that. And so his attention, he placed on God, the men of God, who God was speaking through. Recognized attention, and then A took action in his faith. Um, he, uh, he responded to Peter's request to, to stand up and walk as Peter helped him up. And then that last P and R-A-A-P, is praise. He praised God for the miracle. And that is uh, so important because uh, we can very easily slip into darkness. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> slip into darkness. Any, any, anybody that used to be a fan of war? Yeah. You remember slipping in the darkness? <laughs> it's easy for us to slip into darkness um, without praise. Because we can begin to see, begin to think that we orchestrated it, and all we did was uh, pledge our allegiance and obedience, and allow the power of God to work through us. That's why we praise. We don't take personal credit. So there we have it. This miracle it attracts the attention of the people in the temple, who are filled with wonder and amazement. And so what does Peter do? Peter's paying attention too. Peter pay, seizes the opportunity to now address the crowd. He addresses the crowd. He preaches about Jesus, emphasizing that the miracle was done through the power of Jesus, whom God had raised from the dead. Peter calls the people to repent and turn back to God so that their sins may be wiped out. Uh, this is important because it is through rep repentance that we take our attention and focus off of the rear view mirror and focus on the front window. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, too often we can miss out on today by focusing on yesterday. We can miss out on life. Drive. Do you know what happens when we drive through life looking through the rearview mirror? What happens when we drive through life looking through the rearview mirror is that we miss the day. And we feel like Groundhog Day. Sun has rose and the sun has gone down. And nothing has changed. Because we're just rehearsing reviewing what we have seen in the rear view mirror. Oh my. Well, so it is. <laughs> that, that Paul says, okay, look in the rear view mirror. I'm telling you what you did. Uh, ask for forgiveness that you might move forward. Repent and move forward. And that's the power of repentance. Repent and turn back to look into the windshield and move forward. And that is his demand. <clears throat> and Acts begins. As Peter and John are speaking to the people, they are now confronted by the priests, the captain of the temple god, and the Sadducees. My, my. Uh, isn't it funny that the religious leaders 
throughout the movement of God are the one that become so frightened of doing something new that they uh, seek to seek to try to stop what's unstoppable. And that is the move of God, the religious leaders of all people. And so as religious leaders, as Christians, we've got to be careful that we don't stand in the way of what God is doing. And we're going to be talking about how you can uh, how you can verify whether God is doing it or not. And I and look, we'll make it simple. If you see if it's expanding someone's capacity to love others, then God is in it. Period. 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 How do I know that? Because God is love. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If, if you see an orange on the ground, and there's no stores around, and you're in the middle of the uh, middle of uh, field in Florida, chances are better than good there's a there's a uh, orange tree somewhere, right? Well, if you see someone who is expanding their capacity to love other people, then chances are better than good that their box is expanding. What is the box? The box we mm -hmm. It will, it will always be part of what we talk about. It is the bark marks, marks the limitations of our understanding. Everybody has a box. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's where you currently are. And God is always pressing on our box in order that we might become enlarged in our past capacity to receive God and then in our capacity to share God. All right. So it is Peter and John speaking to the people. He seized on the opportunity. They're confronted now by those who says, no, my, they, they, they got rigid boxes, right? Um, for, there's a lot of reasons for that. And we're going to talk about, um, shucks, I'm going to give you five reasons why their boxes have been so rigid all of a sudden and so uh, fortified. Uh, again, the box is the limitations of their understanding that they are clinging to, not trying to move forward. They are putting, they're looking through the rearview mirror. This is what we've seen. This is what we've seen. Everything must fit into what we have seen, as opposed to looking forward. So, why is it that these men, right? Uh, these, the, the cap, captain of the temple guard, the Sadducees, that these leaders are greatly disturbed. Um, well, I want to give you five reasons. I'm going to put them in there and I'm going to say a word about, about each of them. Here are the, some of the reasons why these men are so, uh, so, so rigid in their thinking. And, uh, it's good reason. Because, you know, there's a little bit of us, uh, let me say a whole lot of us, uh, that resonates with the early disciples. The leaders are greatly disturbed because the apostles are teaching the people and proclaiming the resurrection of the dead in Jesus. Okay, so that's where we start off with understanding why they are so upset. It's important to understand why they're so upset because this is where the thing kicks off, right? We could go back and trace where it kicked off uh, in Jesus when things really hit the fan. Uh, when you go back to the gospel, when it says Jesus set his eyes on Jerusalem, right? Um, that's when stuff kicked the fan. That's when individuals had reached a place of no return that they were going to seal their box in and anyone trying to change that, they were going to seek to distinguish or extinguish, I should say. Um, they were fearful because of theological disagreement. Let's start there. The Sadducees were a significant part of the Jewish religious leaders, okay? Sadducees, part of the leadership. Here's the problem. They did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. Hmm. Let me say that our belief systems should be growing, right? Just think what would have happened if the early disciples' belief systems never grew. If, they, if their belief systems never grew, 
then we would have never had an invitation to receive the gospel. They were taught that the Messiah was coming for the Jewish people. And then their belief systems grew as God revealed it to them, right? Revealed it to Paul on the road to Damascus, revealed it to Peter when he saw, uh, had the vision of the uh, different animals coming down. That was new, that was new, it was a revelation. It was a new way of believing and again, how can you tell if something is from God or not? Um, is it being more inclusive or is it excluding people of God? Yeah, yeah. And then secondly, is love and humility growing or not? These are things to look for in your personal growth. If you're becoming more judgmental, right? then we need to talk about changing your focus. If you're becoming more accusatory, maybe God's trying to tell you something, right? And so we need to examine that as we move forward because there are signs, telltale signs of growth and there's telltale signs of, telltale signs of stagnation. Okay, big problem. Sadducees, they got a problem with this resurrection thing and they ain't having it. They don't believe it. Don't you know that if we focus our attention somewhere, it don't matter if a man is lame and walk, we still ain't believing. That's what this text is all about. And that's the warning to you and I. If our understanding is so sealed in, we can miss God. Not only can we miss God, we can fight against God. And so the plot thickens and unravels. Sadducees, we don't believe it. La, 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 la. You can say what you want to do. La, 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 la. You can cause, you can cause the most, the, the miracles all you want. I can't see it. I can't hear it. And so there's a problem there. They, they, they're, they're, their walls of understanding are fortified. Now, uh, Pharisees, they they kind of okay with the this part with the uh, rising from the dead uh, and the teachings of Jesus. Okay, some of them can go with a lot of what Jesus saw, um, but so there is this disconnect between theological agreement. However, with the Sadducees and Fa Sadducees and Pharisees believing <laughs> together. Yeah, yeah, because it's interesting. Don't you know sometimes uh, strange people can make bedfellows? <laughs> Lord have mercy. <laughs> what does that mean, bedfellows? That means you can have a whole bunch of folks that don't like each other, but then they can dislike something even more <laughs> that brings and unites them. Jesus. Their fear of losing authority and control makes strange bedfellows. You watch out for this too, because uh, I want you to think about this the next time that someone, someone that uh, you really are on different frequencies with, and then all of a sudden y'all on the same page, right? Make sure that that's being used uh, so that your box is not fortified, but that your box is indeed uh, expanding. Please remember that. That's a sign, right? When you when it's yeah when there's an alignment with strange which with uh, strange bedfellows, it can be from God, right? <clears throat> if it's an expansion, right, of love and humility, and inclusiveness in others, uh, it is a uh, shrinking or fortified of looking through that rear rearview mirror, if indeed it is uh, forming a more exclusive club. My mind. Okay. 
authority and control. They agreed that they've got a problem here. The temple authorities, including the priests and the captain of the guard, they were responsible for maintaining order and orthodoxy on the temple grounds, okay? They said what went on. They did what was supposed to, uh, they, they set the stage for everything. Now, all of a sudden, you got Peter just standing up, starting to teach. What is this all about? The apostles teaching, especially in the busy temple area. Come on, of all places, y'all going to start uh, uh, changing the order of things. It threatened their control. Here's the challenge. The message of Jesus and the Messiah and his resurrection could incite unrest or shift the people's allegiance away from the established religious leaders. Authority and control, my, my. Thirdly, political stability. What's that all about? Well, the religious leaders were also concerned about maintaining a stable relationship with the Roman authorities. The Roman authorities, they were running things, make them mad, then, uh, then it's going to upset the apple cart. We don't want to uh, upset the uh, Roman uh, government. We don't want to upset the Roman authorities. And this joker uh, could kick things off to mess things up. Number four, popularity of the apostles. Hmm. What if these jokers become more popular than we are? Yeah. You know, it's the human condition. I'm here to tell you that when you start growing, you're going to have to fight against uh, as you continue to grow, I should say, you're going to have to fight against those things that take your attention away, right? Yeah, yeah. And we must under we must get to that place where we look at every situation uh, where where uh, John the Baptist says, "I must decrease as he increases," right? Um, we must consistently be um, attuned to decreasing in some type of authoritative way such that the spirit can increase so that we're in it for the right reasons. They were afraid, Acts 4 and 4. Uh, well, and if they were afraid about the uh, this movement gaining more, ex more uh, excitement than uh, what they had, they had good reason to be afraid because Acts 4 and 4 tells us that uh, during this time, about 5,000 men and he taught, didn't it not include women and children, but about 5,000 men uh, became believers. Now, here's the thing. These folks, we've got to understand that they're talking to uh, non-religious folks as well as religious folks. And so if all that we have is religious friends, then who are we going to convert? I'm just saying, if you and I commit ourselves to the four walls of the church, then we can guarantee that the church will die. Yeah, yeah. But what does evangelism look like in the 21st century? Glad you asked. We're going to get there. Okay. Lastly, in this uh, list, miraculous healings. Uh, the miraculous healings performed in the name of Jesus not only validated the apostles' message, but also demonstrated this divine approval, right? Surely something is going on here. Uh, we're not used to this kind of miracles. Look at this man, right, from birth. Yeah, he's not only uh, not lame anymore, he's leaping. So this is the backdrop of some of their fears. So Peter and John are arrested and put in jail until the next day as it was already evening before uh, uh, evening. Um, and so that's why they were put in jail. So I'm gonna unpack that a little bit. They were put in jail, okay? And then the, the scripture says, uh, they were put in jail until the next day as it was already evening, okay? In short, it's evening time, right? Um, and what are we going to do with these guys now? They arrested him. We got to do something with them. Why not just have the court case? Why not have it that evening? Well, 
um, it's against Jewish law. At the time, it was against Jewish law. Legal proceedings and trials could not be conducted at night. So that's why. And they weren't going to let those jokers go to that. Huh. All right. We're going to see even crazier stuff. But um, they arrest them. It's late in the evening. They can't uh, perform the trials because it's against their law. So that's why they are put in uh, jail. So now this sets the stage for the unfolding of the events in Acts chapter 4. Peter and John now must defend their actions, right? And their faith before the religious authorities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Their, uh, Reba's dad used to always, used to tell famous saying that, uh, that hits the point here. Uh, a person, A person, uh, a person forced to convince, to, to uh, a person forced to change their will, right, is of the same mindset still. Um, and so, what that's talking about is, um, some if somebody doesn't want to change their mind, right then you can talk to your blue in the face. And how many know that's not a good uh, use of energy? Mm. <laughs> yeah. If, it's one thing to teach, and it's another thing to waste energy if um, uh, the spirit is not present that gives teaching. Spirit is revel is is the, the the Holy Spirit is what gives revelation. It reveals. So if you're ever in a conversation and uh, you start noticing that it's about winning an argument, please, please, please hold your peace. Stop wasting your energy. I'm not saying be disrespectful. I'm saying being be very be very respectful. Yeah, and in fact, being very respectful could indeed uh, be just what's needed for that person's head and heart to, to connect and for them to finally say, I am really trying to understand what you're saying. As opposed to them, uh, I am really trying for you to see what I'm saying and not only see what I'm saying, take my side. <laughs> so just notice it, right? Because notice it in other people and notice it in yourself. Notice when you're being, notice when you're unteachable. Yeah, Lord have mercy. Part of self-awareness, self-awareness is knowing when you're not connected head and heart because that's, you're not teachable then because you're going to be going one way. Uh, yeah, yeah. How your feelings are going to take you one way and your intellect's going to take you the other way. Um, so notice that within yourself uh, and you shouldn't, you shouldn't try to, to learn heavy and deep things, right? When you're disconnected and learn what disconnects you. I'll tell you what disconnects me. When I'm hungry and tired, I am disconnected, right? Even when um, I'm studying the word, if I'm tired, I, I can't stay focused, right? So um, if I have things to do, if you've got things to do, right, in your day, do those things that don't take a lot of spiritual energy during the times where your energy uh, is kind of low. Okay. Um, I'm going to uh, show this video. Then I'm going to stop and ask for questions uh, and or comments, and then we will go deeper. It is a lot here, and uh, we won't get to all to it tonight but I promise that I will um, continue the recording afterwards. So when you go back, if you want to, this is just for those who are hungry, right? This is just for those who uh, 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 want to go to that next place. Yeah, yeah. Um, and just because you, you want to, you, you may not be there tonight. Keep on praying, maybe tomorrow night. So I want to make sure that you can go to this reservoir of information and uh, train, transformative information so that you can receive it. It's not only by the words that I'm saying, 
but it's the spirit by which they're being delivered. Okay, uh, that'll make more sense later. If it doesn't, ask me to come back to that. We're going to watch a video now, and this video is simply of uh, Acts, the fourth chapter. Yeah, the words will be on the screen, and uh, it's easier to follow along, and it flows pretty well. Um, this is the NIV uh, audio Bible from Kim's Lighthouse. Um, I strongly recommend that you download it for your own records or for your own capacity. When come on now, if you're too if you're too tired to read the Word of God, listen to it. <laughs> yeah, come on, come on. <laughs> I didn't say fall asleep, but you can still listen to it. All right, here we go. Acts chapter four. We're headed there. Mm -mm -mm -mm. That looks like it there. Share. And I'm going to stop. Well, well, well. The bulk of it's one through twelve. Then they caught. Then they start explaining some stuff. While I'm joke is so upset, but uh, so let's listen to it. Uh, we'll listen to all twenty three, and then we'll come back and start. Uh, I want you to here again. Uh, I'm speaking fast, but uh, and I always talk about um, actions and also um, your posture and how you, you're being. Um, and even though you're, you're, even though I may be talking too fast for your brain to uh, take every word in sequence, the spirit that's present that's, that's sharing this um, uh, is allowing you to follow this uh, on, on what I would say e even a subconscious level. So I want you to now listen to the text and tell me what's going on with you. What, uh, where, what is going on this evening with you in this text? What's jumping out at you? What questions you have? And I just want to see, see, uh, see, see where you are after we watch this. Here we go. Chapter four. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, elders, and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Aeneas, the high priest, was there. And so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the other men of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, If we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men? They asked. Everybody living in Jerusalem knows they have done an outstanding miracle, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn these men to speak no longer to anyone in this name. I want to stop right there and see uh, what resonates with you so far. And I'm going to kind of leave it open-ended. I've got plenty of questions, but just so far, anybody, uh, uh, any ahas so far? Or <clears throat> let me make sure. Uh, yeah, keep your phone off. We're going to hear from Michael. And then just take yourself off mute. 
and I can see your microphone, whether it's off mute and I'll call on you. So if you want to speak and, uh, okay, they should be able to hear you, Michael. Well, my aha moment is first Peter speaking up and giving an account of things to the Sanhedrin in detail to the point where one, they could not de deny his knowledge and background. Two, there's an old saying, you cannot deny what your eyes can see. As much as in their mind that they wanted to discredit him, could not deny that that same man that they had seen before, who was lame, is now standing there, praising God right next to him. And so you have these two things. And so it's like the pastor said earlier, when you have something, it's there, but they're determined even though they see it, they know it happened, they can touch it, they can smell it. They're just trying to find a way to discredit it because they, they can't accept it. Yeah, yeah, Lord have mercy. Well said, Michael. And you'll, and you'll remember that Jesus said the same thing. He said, look, guys, I know your head and heart are disconnected, but if you can't believe the words I'm saying, at least believe the uh, what you're seeing with your eyes. Yeah. Anyone else, anyone else? Uh, I got something. Can you hear me? Yeah, so we loud and clear. There was a story going around, uh, I think late in the 15th or 16th century, about a Catholic cardinal walking with a lowly monk. And he passed by some buildings and he said, silver and gold I do not have. He said, we no longer need to say that. So the monk replied, but neither can you say, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the way, that's how he was able to, to uh, uh, heal, the, heal the, the person that could not walk. So Peter and John wanted to give him something more than something greater than than supporting the man in his condition, like money or whatever have you. They wanted to transform his life by the power of Jesus Christ. And it's also known as not the church's business in this world to simply make the present condition more bearable. The task of the church is to release here on earth the redemptive work of God in Christ. Okay, I'm out. Um, what I like about what Tommy said, especially there in the end, is this thing about uh, uh, we can falsely get to believe that the deeper we grow in Christ, this falsity that, okay, then all my troubles are going to go away. All my challenges are going to be more bearable, right? <laughs> uh, yes and no. Challenges are going to uh, still be there. In fact, uh, um, if you if we truly grow in Christ, uh, challenges uh, more than likely will increase. Um, but along with that increase, so will the grace and the peace that comes with that. Uh, what Jesus promises is his peace. What by peace, right? The Holy Spirit brings that peace so that you're able to withstand. You're able to um, have a anchor. Uh, uh, and, and this is an anchor, not like a ship's anchor, but an anchor that actually go, grows stronger over time. And uh, that is this new message, right? That there's something more uh, powerful, more peaceful than external situation or circumstances. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen, amen. What do you think, Sally? It would appear that these people, the council had nothing to offer these people. They hadn't. Mm -hmm. So here they are. They see somebody who does ha have the capacity to, to change their lives or change something in a miraculous way or give them something to hold on to that they never had before. 
that becomes the danger for these men because they have nothing to anecdotally to to give in return nothing but their rules and their laws but nothing to transform them and change them individually so surely they've been thirsting for this and the Holy Spirit makes it so. They can't compete. <laughs> so what do you do? Yeah. I mean, they, they can't word. compete. Yeah. So it, it's, um, so your fear steps, steps in. So what are we going to do with these people? Because our whole, they're about to upset our whole apple cart, you know, our whole existence. If we allow this thing to catch, and it's growing at 5,000 already at base, the potential is huge. And we won't be able to control it or contain it. But they couldn't see the value in it for, them, for themselves to get understanding about the truth of what they were preaching. Oh, it was yeah. only for them to be right yeah. in what they believe. So they weren't even open to see it for what it was. Sally, you, you hit the nail on the head and you hit the, the, uh, the same challenge that you and I have with this man called Jesus with his teachings with the holy spirit we've got the exact same challenge and that is before we're too hard on these Sadduc Sadduc sadducees and pharisees and chief priests and alexander and caiaphas and all these guys we've got to understand that in that society the way it was run what they believed these men threatened that right threaten everything that they believed um, because Jesus was coming with a different mindset. That's why the Bible talks about let this mindset, let the, let the mind of Christ be in you because it it's a different way. It's even a different way of self-governance. Yeah, yeah. And they often directly contradict one another. And so first of all, if we're not open to receiving information from the spirit, and I say we, because this is an experiential opportunity we have in every experience that we have. Share a quick story. So um, yeah, <laughs> and it's really this simple. It's every situation you can see God trying to expand whether you are going to open yourself up to new things or whether you are going to say, no, I ain't got time for that. Don't you know, Peter and John could have said, I'm so, I'll see you on the way out if you're still here, or, but I've got to go be about my father's business. <laughs> so, I got to go pray, right? Uh, I got to go. They could have been so boxed in on how they thought God could move that they could have missed this lame man, but they stop, right? I'll give you an example. Yesterday, Lord have mercy. So got my day planned out, Tommy, right? And I got a seven o'clock meeting uh, planned with the men. Uh, and uh, 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 I know I, I know I need some new running shoes because I uh I'm I'm at this place now where that's uh uh I, I'm gonna put it out there. I think I got another marathon in me. We'll see. But anyway, uh so I gotta do that. And then at six o'clock, I get this call from my daughter. Today you wanna go play tennis. All right. So there's a couple of problems with that. <laughs> uh I haven't I didn't I haven't played tennis in a week 
Well, hold on a second. I haven't played tennis in over 15 years. <laughs> number, two. number two, um, I've been nursing uh, uh this 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 uh hamstring and uh uh other uh hip kind of thing and haven't even been out there. And I got a schedule. I got to be on this call in an hour. Short story. The spirit said, and, and I heard the argument between my head and my heart. It was very clear. Um, and so I said, yes. <laughs> and I just watched my, uh, I watched my spirit and head come into alignment. I didn't know how I was going to do all that. It all came into place. Ended up getting my shoes on the call with the men. Didn't go at seven o'clock or at six o'clock, but we did go at eight o'clock. And I wanted, so we out there playing tennis from eight to about nine, nine thirty, something like that. Uh, but anyway, it was in playing that tennis, in, if you want to call it playing tennis, <laughs> let, let, let's say we're hitting the ball back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> it, that, it resembled that more. Um, but some of what I was praying for God chose all showed all of that events for it to happen that night through that process. And I laid down last night just amazed. What if I had said no? I would have missed the move of God that he wanted to show me through a different way. What if Peter and John had said, no, I don't have, uh, I've got to go pray. I got to go to this or that. Long and short of it, uh, when what they were going to pray about and pray for, God did on the way for them to do that. <laughs> How many know that they were praying so that God's power might, that, that the reason we pray is so that we get to know ourselves, who we are in Christ, so that that can be unleashed, who we are in Christ and who Christ is in the world. Newsflash, uh, the only capacity you and I have to show the world who Christ is, uh, is a capacity that comes from us knowing ourselves, knowing who we are in Christ. And that's a daily opportunity to grow in that. And so they stop and what they're going to pray for, yeah, yeah to be closer to God is unleashed in their stopping to include this lame Mac on lame man on their journey. All right, let me throw some mud in the water. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and to take one of both of these questions and uh, together or separate, I'll put them in the chat. Okay, let's, what's this thing? How can we interpret? Uh, how can we interpret um, Jesus talking about the name of uh, under no other name can we uh, be saved? So I've put in there, what does Peter mean by saying salvation is found in no one else but Jesus? Okay. Now it's possible for him to have meant something there. And it's possible for us to understand it in a larger context. Come on now. Is it possible that some of what was understood in the context of biblical writing can be understood in a larger context 2,000 years later? I just float that. Let me go back to the question. What does Peter mean by saying salvation is found in no one else but Jesus? How can we interpret the name of Jesus in a way, uh, we're not going to do that last part, not going to do that activity, but in the, how can we interpret the name of Jesus in a way that includes respect and dialogue with people of other faiths? All right. Just forget that activity part. I'm shifting that up. Talk to me. What is Peter? Uh, let's, 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 first, I'm not, not what you and I mean, but what do you think Peter meant when Peter says 
salvation is found in the one, uh, is found in no one else but Jesus. What do you think Peter meant? Talk to us, Michael. Uh, Let's go, Michael, then Sally. So to me, when I when when I to me when I hear back what Peter said, Peter is reiterating what Jesus told them when he told them that he was the way, the truth, and the light. Nobody comes before the Father but by me. And then the last thing he told them, if you ask anything in my name. I will give it to you. And then he, so he told him that he was the path to salvation. Peter seeing that, believing that, lived that, reiterated what Jesus had taught them. Because he said, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And by calling out in his name, was Jesus said that this would happen. By faith, it occurred. Amen. 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 So we see a direct connection with the Gospels, right? The, the Let's call them the canonical Gospels, those that were put nice and, and tightly in our, um, in, in our modern Bible. Um, uh, they're repeating what was said, okay? What do you think, Sally? Well said. Well, I mean, it's kind of, I mean, what Michael said, if God, if God designated Jesus to be the savior of the world, then there's no other equal. Yeah. yeah. There is no other equal. Yeah. So it is only, that is the order that God created from the beginning. That's the only, that's why Jesus came for the salvation of the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen. Amen. Okay. So 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 we say we're, period, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he said, look, this is this is the way. Jesus said, look, I'm I'm just gonna tell you it's simple. Uh I'm the way, the truth, and the light. No one comes to the Father. Right, exactly. Me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and so we get that, we get that. Now, 2,000 years later, what are some of the thoughts that you might have when it comes to the second question? So how can we interpret, he says, uh, in the name of Jesus, how can we interpret uh, the name of Jesus in a way that includes respect and dialogue with people of other faiths? Mm. Or or all them jokes going to hell. What do you think? <laughs> Come on, talk to me. They all going to hell. <laughs> uh, how how do we reconcile this? <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me try to answer that. All right, come on, Tommy. The man's been lame for more than four years. Had been crippled since birth, right? And he was a very familiar sight at the temple gate. Therefore, Jesus must have passed him by many times without healing him. Mm -hmm. I guess we have to say the one reason why Jesus didn't heal him is is because God timing is just as important as his will. And everything is done for the greater glory of God. And under that premise, Christ healed this man from heaven through his apostles. I'm done. Man, you just added a key component in in this in this whole scheme of uh, our earthly existence, right? Yeah, so in God's timing, everything's about God's timing. Uh, or, or, or let's say God's timing is just as important as the miracle itself. And if, if we throw the timing into it, uh, 
over time, as we understand this Gregorian calendar and our way of measuring time, um, there are some things that are predestined or uh, are waiting us tomorrow that we're not re ready to receive today. And even in the timing of Jesus expanding the word of God, right? The timing. He started off with the Jews. When they first set out, they were just going to the Jews. Mm -hmm. Jesus said it himself. Um, you know, I came first for, um, for the children, right? Uh, speaking of Israel, uh, speaking of the Jews, he said, uh, that's who I came for first. There's a timing, right? And then that gives us the first glimpse that the season's getting ready to change. When the lady says, yeah, but you got food. Uh, but even the master allows the dogs to eat the food or the crumbs that fall off the table. So that was, you know how like right now uh, we're getting a glimpse that summer's up, coming on, summer's on its way, a new season. Yeah, I, I love that. I, I I drive my kids in Canada's crazy. There's a sign. Like when when in the fall, when you smell that first decaying leaf in the in the in the moisture of the air, there it is. Uh, they say, I know, I know, I know. Get some some get ready to change your fall. And then uh something happened again, and uh, uh, there it is. I know, I know. Fall get ready to turn to winter. But I love those hints, right? And so we got we get the hint of the expansion of God's timing from the Jews to the Gentiles. Well, as time goes on, we still see the expansion, right, of God's word to include more people, right? Um, because you're not going to see someone that is not a child of God. And we're not called to stick our head in the sand and say that, um, say that all these people got it wrong and we got it right. Okay, how can we, let's ask a deeper question. How can we reconcile uh, both these things? And I'll give you this scripture as we come to a close to consider this, um, just in helping to reconcile this. This is one of my favorite scriptures around this, this conversation. And it comes out of John, John 10, 16. Um, Jesus says, and I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice. <laughs> and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. So this uh, brings about this inclusive potential, right? And has been interpreted various ways to discuss the relationship between Christianity and other religions. Yeah, yeah. And so I'll, 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 I'll stop there, um, but I'll say this. The name of Jesus, um, and we could get into a lot of uh, even even Jesus, right? When we say Jesus, they didn't say Jesus, right? Uh, um, they would have been saying Yeshua, uh, but and we say Jesus, right? Um, so we're not exactly saying the same name. So we know that it's the concept of the name when we pray in Jesus' name. Um, but even deeper than that, it's who Jesus is and what Jesus represents, right? And so as we think of those that are in uh, other religions, right? Maybe they are part of the sheepfold too. Maybe they are part of this universal scope of God's plan. Maybe there is some unity under this one shepherd. Maybe God is speaking to them in a language that they hear his voice. And it is the message of Christ. 
But I pray you will consider how God is expanding your ability to receive how God wants to draw you closer and in drawing you closer, increase your capacity to draw others. And we'll stop there. We'll go a little bit deeper on Sunday. Amen. Closing comments. Uh, let's hear from a folks. What's your takeaway from tonight? What are you taking away? My takeaway on this um, is to, to be aware that I am always open to receive God's blessing. No, no, no matter what state of mind I am, to pray about it every day that I am available. Yeah, I'm writing that one down. I want that. That's mine, too. <laughs> you see? Uh, yeah, that's, that's one I need. Okay. Stay open. Yeah. And not to expect, look, not, not to say, God, if you don't come this way, I can't receive you. Mm. I better not think that. <laughs> yeah. What do you think, Michael? God basically said in a nutshell, the, 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 I, I always use it, your term, put ourselves in a posture to be open to receive. And not be so structured and rigid of how it's going to come. Like you said, if it, it don't come this way, it's not going to happen. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because God's timing and his, his way of doing things, his ways are not always as high as the heaven is above the earth, so are his ways are above ours. Mm, mm. Amen. Amen. All right. I would say that Peter knew that these people seeing this miracle didn't mean all that much to them. Mm. Because, and the reason he went on to talk Christ was because he remembered that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And we'd all be tasked to remember that when we want to approach someone about Christ and talk about Christ. Amen. 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 Yeah. 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 One more. One more for the good of the cause. Amen. I was reading from my Bible. What I like was the summary I got from the third part. You know, they broke it down like you did one, two, and three. But the third part was when Peter changed the whole subject from the healing of the crippled man and and um, based it all on, uh, it was, he changed it, changed the subject from healing to salvation. And um, that's what, that that stuck that's sticking with me the most. Uh, it says the physical. It says that Peter changes the subject from healing to salvation. The physical restoration of the crippled man is pictured of the salva of the salvation available to all people through Jesus Christ. So, I like that. Yeah. Nice. Nice. <clears throat> nice. Amen and amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's uh that that's awesome, Trina. Yeah, yeah. And as we think about how God blesses us and provides miracle, miracles, right? It's tied to that next piece, salvation. It's tied to what Tommy said. Uh, the miracle was to empower the word of God, right? Uh, in order that they might preach it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So by them sharing their miraculous story 
And I'm here to tell you, when you tell something, someone that wants to hear, someone that's thirsty, someone that may not be sitting by the beautiful gate, but somebody that's anxious and ready to receive a word from God, your miracle, if it's a miracle to you and you share it, yeah, yeah it just might be God's timing for them to receive theirs and or to receive the salvation that comes with, you know, I can relate to Tommy. I can relate to Sally. I can relate to Nisi. I can relate to Louise. I can relate enough. Now, now I've got to ask myself, or now I've got to ask them, what must I do to receive this salvation? And so the reason for the praise, ultimately the reason for the miracle is to expand the tent of God uh, right here on earth. May we go to places where, uh, well, newsflash, 2024, there are more non-Christians than Christians. So uh, that means that if we're going to spread the word of God, we can go just about anywhere and uh, find the capacity to ask God, right, to be open, whether in the uh, grocery store or rather in the uh, uh uh, driving down the highway in a certain posture, wherever you are, what does it mean in that situation to take on the mindset of Christ and to not limit how Christ might move in that situation, wherever we are at any time, right? How, how might you smile at somebody? How might you say good morning? How might you position yourself, right? How might you listen to someone? right? That you're the next part in that, in that plan. How might you be interrupted in your daily plans, right? Uh, so that God might bless someone else while God is blessing you, because that's how God always does it. God, yeah, God blessed the lame man, but he also blessed 5,000 people. <laughs> yeah. And he blessed Peter and John. And we, as we'll see, did, did things get easier? They doing so good, blessing all these people. Did Pete, did things get, are things going to get easier for John and Peter? Come on. Yeah, let's stay tuned. All right, Candace, who's going to close us out in prayer? Um. Let me see who's on here. Hmm. Uh, Tommy, he was on a roll, so he might as well finish it. <laughs> Amen. I knew you were going to do that, Candace. Why didn't you say your buddy Loretta? Because <laughs> it's her birthday week, so that's why. Okay. Happy belated birthday, Loretta. I think it was yesterday. Uh, what's the day? Yes. She said, thank you. <laughs> Precious Lord, Lord, we thank you. We have so many things to thank you for. Tonight, we thank you for the lesson that we shared together. We thank you for all that were present under the ears and eyes. We thank you, Jesus, that you are our God, that you are a wonderful God, that you hear all our prayers, that you know our prayers before we ask for them. We thank you for our learning, Lord. We thank you to help push our learning, open our ears and open our hearts so that may, we may hear with our ears and know with our heart. Thank you, Lord, again. We thank you for our pastor and we thank you for all those participating in this in this study, Lord Jesus. We thank you. And, and in your name, we say amen. 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 Stay encouraged, everybody. Have a great rest of the week. For those that are... Um, just, Quick news flash: those that are um, uh, wondering about um, the date for uh, Rita's home going, uh, I am in touch with her two sons, and we don't have a date yet. Uh, but just keep them in prayer, and uh, you'll know as soon as uh, as soon as I know. Amen. Have Good a night, great everybody. night, everybody. Happy birthday, Loretta. Happy birthday, Loretta. Happy birthday, Loretta. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Nisi, I left you a message.
Yeah, I got it. Okay. All right, good. Thank you. Okay. All right.